get there in one second here real quick. You know, it's uh, Memorial Day, and I put on this tiger shirt. I said, honey, is it okay if I wear a tiger shirt? She said, well, it's Memorial Day. You can do a little, put a little flag on there just so to let you know that it's, it's, I recognize it's Memorial Day. I'm not going to the tiger game, just so you know that. But uh, I want to share a little joke with you before we get started, okay? A guy was walking along the beach in Malibu when he came across a salt-encrusted piece of metal. He worked for an hour or so to remove the salt. Lo and behold, it was a very old oil lamp. The guy started to buffet to remove the vertebrates <laughs> and poof, a genie came out of it. This genie, like all genies, was so happy to be freed from the bottle that he granted the guy three wishes. I wish to be a dollar richer than Bill Gates, said the guy. The genie wasn't sure who Bill Gates was until the guy told him to check Forbes magazine. When the genie called up Forbes from inside the lamp, he learned that Bill Gates was indeed the richest man in the world. Guy, the genie said, you will forever be a dollar richer than Bill Gates. What's your second wish? Genie, I want the most expensive Porsche made, fire engine red, onboard GPS, finest audio system ever installed in an automobile. That's easy, said the genie. He waved his hand in the best car anybody had ever seen pop out of the lamp. The genie then asked the guy for his third wish. The guy mulled the question over and over. A girl, no, I don't need, need a girl, with billions and billions and billions of dollars, I've become a chick magnet already. World peace? Only wackos want that. The guy found a reason not to wish for anything that came to his mind. Genie, the guy said, I can't think of anything now. May I save the third wish for later? Gee, this is most unusual, said the genie. But you hold the hammer, I can't escape from the lamp till you make a third wish. Call me when you're ready. Whoosh! The genie disappeared into the lamp. The guy carefully picked up the now ever so valuable lamp, placed it in the trunk of his porch, turned the radio on and balanced the sound, making all the necessary adjustments to get his great audio system <laughs> customized to his ears. After that, he pulled off the beach and headed south along the Pacific Coast Highway. Soon he was up to 60, 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. This Porsche handled perfectly. The guy was so happy that he began to sing along with the radio. Oh, I wish I were an Oscar Mayer. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Yes. You talk about blowing, okay? Yeah. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. What is your level of faith? Well, I remember hearing this a number of years ago. And it forever changed my spiritual life. That's a question each and every one of us have to ask ourselves. What is my level of faith? What Ron just shared, we'll get to that in a minute. But the level of faith in America right now is almost non-existent. Yeah, sure. And we'll see why in a little bit. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we open your word this morning, that you would teach us Guide us so deeply on the inside that we will never be the same. We'll have this message forever etched on the inside of our soul and our heart. It'll sink all the way down onto the inside of our spirit. Man, we'll latch onto it. We'll ask ourselves every day of our lives, what is my level of faith today? Oh, Father God. Help us to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Verse 5, Luke 8. A sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bore fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he said in a very soft voice. No, it says he cried. He said, he 
that have ears to hear, let him hear. See, people have ears, but some people, when they come to church services or hear the word, they're thinking about the tiger ball game, the pistons, yes. the wings. They're thinking about the Oscar Mayer hot dogs. They're thinking about the, the Chicago style. They're thinking about a lot of things, but they're not thinking about the word of God and what God has to say to them today. And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be or mean? And he said unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Say it with me, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then come the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Right, right next to that verse, distracted. See, they hear it, short time, short term, hear it at the end, but they don't let it go down deep, okay? Something else comes up and they say, oh, hey! They forgot everything they heard that quick. It's just gone. They on the rock are they which when they hear, they receive the word with joy. Hey, wow, wonderful, that was great. I heard some good words today. These have no root, or they have no root in themselves, which for a while, believe, underline that, and in time of temptation, they fall away. Right, right next to that verse, no time spent in the Word. They just said, it sounded real good, but they didn't want to latch on to it very long. That which fell among thorns, and they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches, and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Right, right next to that verse, many, because that's where most of the people in America are. Choked with cares, riches, pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground <clears throat> are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a, covereth it with a vessel, or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made known, neither anything hid that shall not be know, known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, put a big star there, take heed, therefore, how you hear, how you're paying attention, how you're listening. For whoever hath, hath what? hath ears to hear, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, hath not what? Hath not ears to hear. From him shall be taken even that which he seems to have. There was a song years ago that said you'll never get Abraham's blessing with a Thomas kind of faith. <clears throat> it was put out by a guy. And when he was singing that song, he wanted us to understand that the Bible says we're supposed to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The songwriter was David Ingalls. And he, as you read in the Word of God, you'll see that every individual is given a measure of faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot become saved until you hear the Word of God. Okay? So when you hear the Word of God, you become saved. It is right then, at that time, you have the measure of faith. Say, I have a measure of faith. I have a measure of faith. That faith has to grow, though. Yes. <clears throat> now, you can't have faith if you don't hear the Word. That's right. That's right. You can't have it. Now, take a turn with me to Proverbs. Uh, Nate, this isn't in my notes, but I'm going to give it to you anyhow. This will help you. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 30. We all know that since 1963, systematically, we have had prayer removed from the schools. We've had the Bible removed from the schools. We've had the pictures of Christ taken out of the hallways. We've had the Ten Commandments taken out of our courts, our judicial systems, and out of our colleges. So there is no faith. Everybody say, no faith. No faith. Because faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. As a result of that, Listen to what takes place, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 11. There's a generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. 
there is a generation that appear in their own eyes, in other words, we don't need God, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. They think they're better than everybody. We don't need God. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among men. He's saying when you take the word of God out of a, out of a generation, people poke fun, people say things and do things that normal, God-fearing people wouldn't do. Right. I was talking to Judy this past week. Judy, are you here? Okay. Judy and Emma, she was saying, what made America great? I said, I'm glad you asked that question. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 11, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Every one of those passages talk about beware us when you come into the land and you've eaten all the good things. Everybody say it says good things. Good things. Beef, steak, tomatoes. <laughs> Red skin, sweet potatoes. Amen? Yep. Steaks. Yep. Oscar Mayer hot dogs. <laughs> beware us after you come into the land, you've driven four wheelers. Boats, RVs. You have a place up north, one in the middle, and one down south. You can fly over the, all over the world. It says, but where less, you have a big screen TV, but where less after you come into the land, you have all these things that you forget God. Mm -hmm. Come on. That is what has happened to America. Yeah. The reason we have no faith is because we're too busy with our stuff. Come on. And we don't take time to listen to the Word of God. Right. You have to have ears to hear. Let me show you this. So, the first level of faith is this. No faith. No faith. Hey, you can turn with me to Matthew 13, 31 through 32. Faith has to grow. When I was a young man, though you wouldn't believe it, but when I was a young man, I weighed 145, 150 pounds. Bobby, I was skinny. And I didn't want to be skinny anymore. So I said, I want, I want to be able to to be big like everybody else. So I want to lift weights. So my dad got me a set of weights. Started with 110 pounds. All oh, that 110 pounds, I couldn't hardly get it off the bench. And then I read a verse they said, if you add five pounds a week before too long, you'll be able to press your body weight. That's five pounds a week. That doesn't sound so hard. Five pounds every week. When my brother Harvey got drafted, I went down to Fort Stewart, Georgia. There was Fred Gladding and some of the pitches from the Tigers were down there. And I was pressing, bench pressing 285. Now that doesn't sound like much, Donnie. How much did you bench press on? About 330. But that was a hundred and some pounds more than my body weight. I could curl my body weight. But you had to be able, you had to do it day in, day out. I say day in, day out. Your faith is a muscle. And it must be developed. You've got to use it, just like Christy. Okay, she was using it. She kicked it into overgear when she did fasting. Faith has to be developed. Now, if you don't hear the word, you say, I ain't got time for that. I'm going to watch, I'm going to watch, oh, what programs are we going to watch? We're going to watch Sports Center. From sun up till sundown, I'm going to watch Sports Center. It gets so much that you, you know where the ball's going to go after you watch it four or five times. You know who's going to make the shot. You know what their batting average is going to be at the end. But if I ask you, what does the Bible have to say? You say, I don't know. Come on. I don't know. Why? Because your faith is developed in what? Sports, Sports center. Let's look at Matthew 13, 31 and 32 now. Say, I'm going to learn some stuff today. I'm going to learn some stuff today. <clears throat> And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. It's so small you can't hardly see it, a mustard seed. But it's got to be hidden in the field. Guess where the field is? Your heart. Yep. You've got to hide it in there. But when it is grown, everybody say, when it is grown. When it is grown. And see, faith has to grow. It is a grace among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. What's he saying? You hide that faith on the inside of you. 
let it grow and it will begin to provide security for people in your own family and everybody else. But if you don't put the word in there, guess what? You'll have Nothing. no faith. No. You won't have any faith at all. Take a turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Judy just happened to be walking in on this when she asked me that question the other day about America. Have you ever looked at your money? Did you ever look at your money, what you have on there? You have an eagle on some of your money. Do you know where the USA got that symbol? Right from here in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Verse 11, as an eagle stirs up her nest, flutters over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him. That's why we chose that symbol, the eagle. And there was no strange God with him. Everybody say, no strange God. At one time, our God was Jehovah. Our God was God, and we lived for him. And the schools, the families, the courts, all the way through our whole society was permeated with Christianity. I'm going to bring pictures up here one time. It'll show an old man praying like that. It'll show an old man and a woman with a loaf of bread praying. It'll show a picture of Jesus. Every house, I don't care if it was Protestant, Catholic, all had pictures like this. Ten Commandments, Home Interior, the greatest seller was the Ten Commandments. Yes. That's what was on our walls. No wonder our society had faith. That's right. You would mess up and your parents would say, look at that commandment. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Faith was coming by what? Yeah. Hearing and hearing by the word of God. You went to church and the church, the preacher come and his finger was almost in the third row. Right. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. And you knew that you had done something wrong and God wasn't pleased. Verse 13, he made them, this is talking about Israel, he made them ride on the high places of the earth. A nobody. He took the nation of Israel from nothing and made them somebody. He took the nation of the United States from nothing and made them somebody. Amen? They feared us. People feared us that he might eat the increase of the field. He made them to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Butter of kind, and that means goats, and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with a fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst Drink the pure blood of the grape. But Jeshua waxed fat and kicked. You know what that means? When everything started coming their way, they said, we don't need God. Come on. Waxed fat and kicked. Don't want you in our life no more. Get out of here. I got this. I got this one. I can handle this. And God says, no, you can't. You want it that way? God. But Yeshua waxed fat and kicked, thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then, he forsook, then they forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of their salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto demons, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly out whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is what? No faith. Take a turn with me to Matthew 17, 17. You take the word of God out of the society, and guess what you will have? Trouble. No faith. No faith. Everybody say no faith. no faith. If anybody ought to be fighting for the word of God to be in our schools and back in our courts, then it ought to be Christians. That's right. I am an American Christian. Priest of that Born in the U.S. of A. 
I'm an American Christian and know, I know what the Bible says about that. I'm supposed to be standing up for him as salt and light, not say, well, that's what the school says. I can't sing a Christian song in here, so I won't. No, I walk back down and say, yes, I'm in the United States of America. And if they can sing a song about all these other crazy stuff, I'm singing about Jesus. Amen. And I'm singing about God in the United States, and that's how it's going to be. And if they say, well, you won't do it here, then here's what you say. I'm going to put that on, and I'm going to put a little piece of paper, and I'm going to ask if there's other Christians that want to sing Christian songs. I mean, this past year, I was, I was broken hearted. I went to my grandchildren's things. Not one Christmas song. I know. Yeah. Not one Christmas song in the United States of America. Oh, Christmas tree. Oh, Christmas tree. I'm thinking, that's nuts. What about sweet little Jesus boy? Well, nothing about that. Nothing about that, but I could sing all these Kwanzaa songs and everything else. But I couldn't sing about Jesus. And it didn't happen once, it happened in all of them. A society that takes the Bible out will have it be a society that has what? No faith. Let's go to Matthew 17, 17. <clears throat> Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and per, uh, perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Bring, how long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. When you have a faithless generation, you have a what? Perverse generation. Ireland, last night, if you read your paper this morning, Ireland, okay, same-sex marriage. They went against the Catholic Church and they said, we have more of a majority than you. So, same-sex marriage is legal in Ireland as of this morning. Guess what? People say, we want to be just like Europe. Guess what? Then you're going to have a domino effect. It's going to start going this way here in yep. the United States. Yep. If we don't stand up. That's right. We don't we stand. stand. Mark 4, verse 4, 40. I watched him on the news this morning. This guy's arms were twice the size of mine. His name is going to be Lucille now. He's the one that heads it up. I mean, his arms were ripped. I'm thinking, I ain't dating no Lucille. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> and he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? They had no faith because what? They didn't have ears to hear. They wouldn't listen to the Word of God, so they had no faith. And I hear that all the time in my office. Pastor, I have no faith. You know, i got a remedy for that. Get in the Word of God. There you go. That's the remedy for no faith. Get in the Word of God. Begin to immerse yourself in the Word of God day in, day out, day in, day out. Immerse yourself in the Word of God. In Mark 4.40, Jesus expected them to rebuke the wind. Why couldn't they? Because they had no faith. Why didn't they have any faith? Because they hadn't been listening. Take a turn with me to Mark 4.23-25. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, or measure it, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, the hand shall be given, and he that hath what? Not ears to hear shall be taken away, even that which he hath. If you want to have faith, you have to be willing to say, this is what God's word says, and I am going to line up with what God's word says. It doesn't matter in any area of your life. You're having problems in any area of your life. Go through the word of God, find out what the Bible has to say about that area, and work on that area. How many of you can understand that? How many of you got ears to hear? Amen. Let's say you're having problems with your marriage, your communication. It says a soft answer turns away wrath. How hard is that? That means so don't get in a fight with your husband or wife. Well, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Does that mean not to punch it? No. That means a soft answer turns away wrath. Don't don't get in an argument. Just just say well. Honey, I'm not going to fight with you about that. It's not that big a thing. I'm not going to fight with you about that. Joni and I, the first couple of years we were married, 
Uh, she said, I wouldn't fight with her. Do you remember having that little conversation? I wouldn't argue with you. How did you phrase it? And I'd clam up, and you'd say, how can I... I, can, right? I can't fix something if you don't tell me what I'm doing wrong. And she said, well, you ought to know. Well, men aren't like that. <laughs> how many of you men like to be told what you're doing wrong? <laughs> okay? Many. I can't fix something if you don't tell me, well, you ought to just know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a, I'm a dunce, okay? I just don't know. Tell me. I don't want you playing on so many sports teams. I can understand that. How many of you, how many of you guys can understand that? Okay? I don't want you going to Steve's house so much. How many of you can understand that? You ought to know. Just run across and throw yourself across the bed, slam the door. You ought to know. Guess what? That don't work. Okay? <laughs> Faith comes by hearing. Yes. Tell me what's going on here, amen? Second thing, our faith grows by our hearing and acting on the Word of God. So let's go to James 1, 22-25. You have to pay attention to what is being taught, what the Bible is saying, what is being taught in a Bible study, and then do it. James, chapter 1, 22 through 25. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself, in the glass there is a mirror. When you came here this morning, before you came, how many of you looked in the mirror? How many of you did not? It's apparent, okay. <laughs> no, it's not, amen. In other words, you looked in the mirror and you made the necessary adjustments. Okay, verse 24, for he beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty. See, that's what the Bible was designed to do to set you free from problems. I mean, you can understand it. It says, but whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty. That means you look in there. Obey those that have the rule over you. Well, I don't like my boss. Is your boss asking you to steal? No. Is he asking you to kill anybody? No. Is he asking you to do anything that is Unethical, no. I just don't want to do what he says for me to do. Pastor, I just lost my job. <laughs> I can tell you why, okay? <laughs> but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of this work, this man, everybody say this man, this man. shall be blessed in his deed. I remember I worked at Flame Gas Utica. And I was delivering 100 pound propane cylinders to the construction sites because I was the youngest guy and I had to carry these propane cylinders sometimes through the mud over to where they hooked these things up to salamanders net. And I would look around and I would say, Bob, I, I don't want to do that. I said, is there, maybe we can get some of them other guys. He said, those guys are on a job. Warren, you carry that cylinder over there. I would think, oh, but there has to be a better way of making a living than this. <laughs> Your boss asks you to do something, what do you do? do it. You do it, okay. He who had the ears to hear, let him hear. Second type of faith is little faith. Everybody say little faith. Little faith. Let's go to Matthew 6, 25 to 34. What is your level of faith this morning? You're going to be able to identify yourself today before you leave. <clears throat> you're going to see yourself you're going to tell you're going to tell on yourself this morning <clears throat> Matthew 6 25 through 34 now here's what's interesting about this your faith levels can change and fluctuate if you don't stay in there it can look at this one here therefore I say unto you take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink 
nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than clothing? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Point the tap the guy on the shoulder and say you're better than a bird this morning. You can be better than a bird. Which of you, by taking thought, can add 18 inches onto his height? <laughs> by worrying about how tall or short you are, can you add any height to yourself? No. Can't do it. And why take you thought for raiment or clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. It's so funny, as a pastor, I have a guy come by and he says, have you looked at them yellow flowers out in your field? They look so beautiful. <laughs> Those are dandelions. <laughs> and I have people in the church that says, we need to cut them dandelions down. We need to weed them. And this other fellow thought it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass in the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you of little, <laughs> of little faith? Like that. Oh, ye of little faith. Now you're going to identify yourself real quick here. Are you ready? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Where shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil. There are pastors. He's saying, don't think about the future. Absolutely not. What he's saying, Proverbs 29, verse 18 said, says, without a vision, my people perish. So you've got to make some plans. What he's talking about <coughs> is James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Go ye not, ye that say, today or tomorrow we're going to go into such and such a city, we're, we're going to buy and sell and get game, we're going to stay there a couple years, and then we're going to sell our house in three or four years, we're going to flip it and make $100,000, live there two more years, buy another house, flip it and make $100,000. He said, don't think like that. Here's how a person of little faith walks around. There's a downturn in the economy. We're going to, my husband's going to lose his job. You know what? When he loses his job, there goes the car. There goes the house. You know what? Our children are going to, we're probably going to have to wear bad clothes and probably going to have to go without food and everything else. Oh, what are we going to do? Now, the guy hadn't even gotten a pink slip yet. He hadn't even, listen, nothing has even happened yet. But a person of little faith looks down the road and sees all the trouble coming their way. How many of you know what I'm talking about? They always stop trouble. You know what? If anyone's going to have a car that, you know, they're going to have a recall on these cars past, you know, and, you know, my car is going to be one of them gets recalled. I just know I'm going to get hit in the face with that uh, airbag. It's going to happen to me. I just know that. That's a little faith. Do we got any people like that here? You know, if anyone's going to get a bad set of tires, it's me. It's coming right. You know what? If anyone gets sick this, summer, this winter, this summer, it's me. I'll get it. It's all that happens to me. That's little faith. You know what? If anyone gets cut from the basketball team, it'll be me. You know, that's just how the baseball team. Uh, you know what? I've been a loser all my life. Loser. But have to me. That's little faith. That's right. Don't talk like that. You just located yourself. I'll never get ahead. I'll never be able to drive a new car. I'll never be able to have a nice house. I'll never have a wife that likes me. Listen, you located yourself. That's the little thing. My husband will never be a spiritual man. My husband will never love God. My husband will never train the kids correctly. That's the little thing. Why not say like this? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. Oh, I want to thank you that you're working in my husband's life, working in my wife's life. I want to thank you that you're working in my employer's life. You're blessing his business. I want to thank you, Lord, that everything else is drying up, but, Lord, not our company. I want to thank you that, Lord, you have just taken our company, put it right in the palms of your hand, and you're working with it right now. I want to thank you for that right now. We have a family that has supported this church for all the years since we've been here. Through good times and bad, through, through their business and that, I mean, you can count on it faithfully. They've done it all the time. 
And you know what? I've never heard them come out of their mouth, we're going to go down, our company's going down. They never talk like that. That's little faith. Look at the person next to you and say, I think he's talking about you. He's talking about you. <laughs> Don't be like this other guy that I knew. We had another guy that he was going to give his way to prosperity. Sounded good. He had gotten thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in debt. And so we pulled into McDonald's and he said, I'm going to pay for the 10 cars behind me. Didn't pay his bills. Didn't do any of that. Just but I'm going to pay for the 10 cars behind me and I'm going to believe God for a hundredfold return. I said, you can't do that. He said, yeah, I can. He says, give and shall be given unto you. I said, no, that's Luke 6.38. It says, give and shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall man give into your bosom. But here's what the part that he missed. For God so loved the world. Say it with me. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. What motivated God to give? His love for you and I. Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us. So what has to motivate us in our giving is not giving to get, but because we love God. And I was talking to him about it, and he says, well, <clears throat> am I wrong to give? I said, no, you're not wrong to give, but your motives are totally wrong for giving. You're trying to give to get rich. You give because that's what God commands us to do, to give. Solution for little faith, I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14, 25 to 31. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto the end of the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. Underline that. Peter what? Walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Underline little faith. Now here's how little faith always works. Little faith always looks at the problem eventually. Little faith starts out believing correctly, is standing firm, but then when the situation or problem changes and seems to be going contrary to what he says he believes, he looks, number one. Number two, he becomes afraid. Number three, he cries for help. And then number four, he sings. It always works like this. Go to Romans 4, 16 through 21. You can read this when you get home. Weak faith, little faith, always considers its resources, then gives up and quits. Listen, you don't want to be in little faith either. You want your faith to grow. Little faith starts out correctly, but then something comes up and it says, oh, it's not going to work out either. It was just a pie in the sky. It was never going to work anyhow. That's not how where you want to be. You want to be, your goal is to become strong in faith. My goal, your goal is to become strong in faith. Then when situations come up, how many of you hate the way it's going in America? <coughs> Those who are strong in faith begin to say this. You know what, Lord? In these upcoming elections, your word says that you remove kings and you set them up. Lord, I want to thank you that you're removing ones that shouldn't be in office. Yes. Okay? Amen. And I want to thank you that you're setting up people that should be in office. Yes. I want to thank you, Father God, that the ones that are in office right now, that you are surrounding them with godly counselors. Yes. That's how strong faith begins to talk like that. Weak faith says, ah, oh, you know what? America's going down the tube. <laughs> That's the end. Might as well give up. That's not going to get us any time. We have to get back. The solution for no faith is what? Get in the Word of God. The solution for little faith is what? Begin to talk correctly. Day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. 
let's say you have a husband that just started going to church with you. Just say, well, he's just going to get something. That's all. That's all. That's, that's a, don't do like that. Right. Say, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. My husband's going to church with me now. You got a wife that just started going to church. Say, Lord, thank you. Right. Thank you that you're working in my wife's life. Amen. Then you, you see your husband reading the Bible. And don't go like this. I don't know why you read it. You won't live it anyhow. <laughs> That's really going to cause his faith to grow. Yes. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but you watch that Jesus program. You know you're not going to do it. <laughs> Come on. That's little faith. Yeah. Faith says, oh, Lord. Thank you. Oh, Lord. It does not yet appear what we shall be. Yeah. Mm. But we know he's growing to be just like Jesus. I want yes, to thank amen. you. Oh, Father God, if you can take a hard case like Peter and a hard case like Saul, you can sure, I got one in my house right now. And you can sure work on him right now. I thank you that you're polishing it. My husband is a sharp fellow. I want to thank you that he's a smart man. I want to thank you that he loves the Lord like no other man. That he's starting to fall in love with Jesus like never before. Watch how far that your husband, watch how far your home will change. I want to thank you, Lord, that my family's coming in. Coming into this Jesus thing. They've fallen in love with you, Lord. I've been praying for that for a lot of years. Don't walk around like so many other people. And belittle your husband and your wife and your children in there. How many of you came out of the womb and you were just perfect people when you came out? No, you were not. Don't nod your head. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There was no perfect people. Never are any perfect people. But you stay in the Word of God. Watch how He'll change your lives. That's as far as we're going today. Next week, we're going to look at faith. We're going to look at faith. Where's your faith today? Is it faith or no faith? Faith. Okay? Where is it? Or is it little faith, I should say? Is it little faith or no faith? Watch your mouth. If it's little faith this week, make some changes. Stop talking about what's going to happen terrible. Start talking about positive things, what God's doing. Amen? Get over onto the believer side. Amen? It's a victory side. I can tell you that right up front. Amen? That's where it's at. Father, I want to thank you for Memorial Day. I want to thank you for Memorial Day weekend where we get to go with our families and our friends. And I want to thank you for these veterans, Lord. Mm -hmm. Your word says, greater love hath no man than this, and that a man lay down his life. Yes. Father God, we have seen this fleshed out in our society. We've seen all these cemeteries, Arlington, and we've seen Normandy and all these places overseas where so many of those who died defending this nation, their bodies lie in rest waiting for when Jesus Christ comes again and those graves are opened up. Mm -hmm. and their body and their spirit are reunited with you. Father, I'm praying right now in Jesus' name that we would see American Christians come together like never before. Yes. Your word says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Help us not to be silent. Jesus saved us, washed us in his blood. Father God, help us to say, and that's enough for me. Jesus did it for me. And now I'm going to give him my whole life. And I don't want to close the service today at all without asking this question. Every head bowed and every head closed. If there's anyone here today who's never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, you're that husband, you're that wife, you're that son, you're that daughter, you're that brother law sister mom. someone invited you here, to hear about Jesus. You're hearing about Jesus right now for the very first time and you want to ask him to come into your life and save you. Would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. And I want Jesus this morning. Not trying to embarrass you. I'll be the first one to meet you up front. And welcome into the family of God. Amen. All right. If you're here today and God is speaking to you, you come. Hallelujah. Now, Father God,